Well, my presentation, The Glossop Apothecary, attempts to trace the development of pharmacy through the work, archives, and prescription books of seven proprietors at 7 High Street West Glossop from 1848, when the premises were built to the requirements of Bernard Edward Howard, the 12th Duke of Norfolk, to 2006. And four generations of my family were involved. Number seven, High Street West, which is down here. I don't think it'll show on there. Where the uh, coach and horses is passing on the right, um, was built by Benjamin Greaves, who was a blacksmith in the, on the Duke's payroll. And in 1852, Thomas Peacock Reeks, who was the first chemist and druggist, registered as one of the first members of the Pharmaceutical Society, founded in 1841 and incorporated by Queen Victoria's Royal Charter in 1843. The ducal crest emblazoned above his shop door bore the motto of the Duke of Norfolk, sole avertus in victor, virtue alone is unconquerable. <laughs> and Rix's 1840 prescription books show evidence of symptomatic prescribing for the cholera outbreak among railway navvies building the Woodhead Tunnel you can see they're using tincture of opium and catacoo, which would counteract acute diarrhea, but taking it with brandy wouldn't do much for the dehydration. <laughs> um, Robert Koch isolated the pathogenic cholera bacterium in 1883, and a vaccine was developed three years later. Um, there are numerous prescriptions for Reek's celebrated worm powders and antimonial wine. Uh, illustrating the overcrowding, poverty, and unhygienic conditions of the working population. Um, in 1852, the prescriptions for the 13th Duke of Norfolk, Henry Charles, and many of his entourage. There's also evidence of racehorse doping. <laughs> you can see that, um, the effects of drugs on the heart were beginning to be understood. Digitalis, which was discovered by William Withering in 1785, and glycerol trinitrate. And they were also using arsenic and cocaine in overdose. Um, indeed, a, a racehorse died of arsenic poisoning in Australia. Um, <clears throat> ironically, the premises became a William Hook Hill book is. <laughs> it isn't now. Um, T.P. Reeks was a tenacious man, a man of experience and aptitude for public business. He was elected a councillor in the first Glossop Borough Council of 1866 after Glossop had survived the cotton famine. Three of his children died in infancy and one was buried at sea. Perhaps that was a legacy of the cotton famine. People were going away. The uh, family grave of the Reeks family is in St. James's Churchyard, Whitfield. Robert Proctor was a proprietor from 1869 to 1897. He soldiered on through the boom, bust, and slump of the cotton industry. Despite many creditors and competition from mail order companies, um, he advertised in the Glossop Dale Chronicle. Trusses, trusses, trusses in all sizes and the very best quality and a, and a private room fitting at our Proctor, 7 High Street, West Glossop. In 2006, trusses were very occasionally fitted using the reclining sofa in the same private fitting room, but it also served for fitting elastic hosiery, triangle skull sandals, smoking cessation, medication use review, so a discreet knot was necessary. <laughs> uh, he was succeeded by William John Grace Moran, a mason who graduated uh, previously a dispenser at Manchester Royal Infirmary and Monsell Fever Hospital. He passed the minor examination to qualify as a chemist and druggist in 1891. He is remembered by Moran's bronchial elixir. Uh, under the uh, 
Under the Stamp Act of 1783 until its repeal in 1941, um, secret remedies could be patented without disclosure of their full formulae and extravagant claims could be made like a certain cure. Um, a prime example of this is Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, um, <clears throat> which was used for teething infants, but it contained so much opium that babies became comatose or addicted and on occasion died yet no household should be without a bottle. <laughs> Moran himself died age 44, having run the business from 1897 to 1912. At his internment, the Masonic Brethren, and he was a Mason, laid at the cemetery their sprigs of acacia onto the coffin. He was only 44, and the shop is supposedly haunted by his ghost. Um, in 1901, Moran had signed indentures with an alderman, Tom Braddock, JP, and his son, John Braddock. And in 1904, my grandfather, Finlay McKinley, also became apprenticed to Mr. Moran, along with a Mr. A Mr. Simpson. In 1909, he registered as a chemist and druggist and purchased with a mortgage the premises from the executors of W.J.G. Moran. You can see under the Ducal Crest, late Moran. In 1924, Finlay was involved in a lengthy dispute with the Royal Warrant Holders Association, um, who, who challenged, of Hanover Square, London, who challenged his right to display the royal arms or arms closely resembling them above his door. Eventually, he was instructed to have, by appointment to the, His Grace the Duke of Norfolk, added in place of late Moran and to have the ducal crest regilded. Not a very good advertisement for the profession because he's smoking. <laughs> That's the, um, the letter challenging his right to display the royal arms are actually unique. Um, the Duke of Norfolk is a premier earl and it's the only example of one of his coat of arms. Um, my grandfather was a man of vision who competed with the burgeoning chemist chain like Boots, who had opened a branch at number 19 High Street West <laughs> by joining National, like the United Chemists Association Limited Cheltenham, and international trading organizations like the United Drug Company of Boston, Massachusetts. And he promoted their Rexall remedies, reap startling one penny bargains in the Rexall harvest sale. <laughs> he died of lung cancer in 1951. His obituary said he was an, an enterprising man who never kowtowed to anyone. Um, my mother and father, Noel and Edith Oliver, named McKinley, ran the pharmacy from 1944 to 2002. My mother qualified as a pharmacist at Salford University in 1944. And after leading the RAF in 1944, my father changed fields from electrical engineering and gained a degree in pharmacy from Manchester University in 1948. Um, Fast-moving lines, oh, I've, I've missed this, show you the um, prescriptions in the imperial units. And you can see that that one was dispensed by Boots in 1924, but probably they hadn't got strengthening medicine for nervous disability and it came to it came to our pharmacy anyway um so fast selling lines in war wartime were paragon anti-gas tape for gas proofing uh, a room and samuel yates seeds for allotments uh, my father continued to promote rexall remedies and an international advertising campaign a typical English bobby needed to be featured. <laughs> this was in a spot the difference uh, competition in the PGA, this photograph. Um, on July the 5th, 1998, the fifth anniversary of the NHS was marked by an article in the Pharmaceutical Journal featuring Noel and Edith's recollections of the first day of the National Health Service. Um, by 1967, a degree in pharmacy had become mandatory prior to registration, and I qualified in, in, from Manchester in 1974. 
I remember the fun and excitement of Victorian weekends, many disputes and crises. <laughs> Neither of my sons wanted to continue the business, uh, nor, none of my sister Pam Sproul's children either. So on the 2nd of May 2006, sold the business to Anwar and Yaku Patel, trading as Cohen's chemists. So we've come a long way <laughs> from compounding medicines and pills from secret formulae to polyclinics, multidisciplinary engagement, transmission, electronic transmission of prescriptions, internet and 24 hour pharmacy. Um, now, as a consequence of the uh, racehorse doping prescription, I was asked by the uh, secretary of the Veterinary History Society to see if there were any more veterinary prescriptions. So I've been back to Manchester to investigate the prescription books and I've found about, 12 uh, in, that 19, in the 19th century. Um, this is the first one. It shows a prescription for a mange parasite of the acarine family. I think um, Maria mentioned this. Uh, the, the groom catches uh, this parasite from a horse or dog. Uh, it's one part of sulfur to 4.8 parts of cottonseed, olive oil, nut oil. And it's got also strong ammoniated mercury ointment for skin infestation. Um, then there's this one for horse balls, <laughs> diuretic potassium nitrate, brown soap, powdered resin, and powdered ginger in ratio two to two to two to one. Um, and then we've got uh, distemper uh, and inflammatory lung symptoms with infusion into the dog's chest for Mr. Coombe's dog. Um, the bowels are kept open with castor oil and buckthorn syrup, and the syrup of poppies is a cough sedative. Potassium iodide supposedly promotes absorption of the effusate, and you've got salsaparilla flavoring. No, half a dose for a small dog. <laughs> um, and then we've got iron and quinine tonic for a collie puppy. Um, compound ferrous sulfate syrup, um, four ounces and 120, uh, no, 12 grains of quinine sulfate. Um, neurological distemper, you've got uh, liquor arsenicalis, 1% um, weight for volume of arsenic trioxide in one to four syrup and water, and one to eight dilution. So it's got about five minims of arsenic trioxide um, twice a day. And more, more horse balls, um, the carminative of caraway, aniseed, cardamom. You've got turmeric and saffron as dyes and flavoring, olive oil demulcent, and you've got licorice, Spanish juice, um, which is an expectorant. So, Really, they're using more or less the same medication as, uh, as for human use. Um, I haven't, this is ongoing research, so I haven't looked at all the um, amounts and converted them from the imperial to metric system. So um, another horse draft with an expectorant and a sedative, ammonium bicarbonate, you've got opium tincture, sweet spirit of nitre, squill tincture expectorant, strong ammonium acetate solution. And then you've got horse liniment, you've got terabenum, turpentine, um, and origami oil, um, and ammonia liniment. Um, this is uh, for a sheep, chloral hydrate. It's not used as an anesthetic, which is unusual. It's used for suppression of methane production in the rumen. Um, and then uh, in 1899, the compound syrup of hyperphosphites, which contains iron, calcium, manganese, potassium, with quinine and strychnine hydrochloride. Again, there's a very small margin between stimulant and poison. <laughs> Ginger tincture and concentrated compound gentian infusion, which is a bitter appetite stimulant and glycerin dimulsant. And then um, 1900 for Mr. Buxton's cow, 
sweet spirit of nitre, which is a diuretic, spirit of camphor, ammoniated tincture of valerian, which is carminative and sedative, capsicum tincture, and um, ammonium acetate solution, which is a mild expectorant. This is 1901, stimulating lotion. Um, origami oil for healing wounds, heart soil and oil of ammonia, um, which has been mentioned already for uh, as a liniment. And uh, I have no idea what uh, Kirkasarini oil is for. <laughs> Couldn't find any reference to that. Um, another one, compound syrup of hypophosphites um, for a dog. It's a tonic, presumably, and uh, also distemper pills. And uh, finally, coming back to the one about racehorse doping, um, if you look in the veterinary counter practice, Chemist and Druggist Series, ninth edition, published 1937, it states the maximum dose of cocaine hydrochloride is five to 10 grains for a horse. Um, but for a horse of 18 months to three years, it should be half the dose. Well, that two-year-old is getting the dose for an adult horse, so that they run like the wind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, uh, I've written a few poems because we used to also dispense prescriptions for um, Edmund Potter's entourage, and he was the grandfather of Beatrix Potter. So I've taken the liberty of giving some of these animals names from Beatrix Potter. Um, so if anybody would like a copy of my book, I've brought some along. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them. <laughs>